Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Tina Thatch, and welcome to Western Window, a show made for you by students at Western Washington University. From algae to sailing, it's all in today's show. We'll begin with Western Zone Dr. Codner and her study of pink snow. We'll take a look at a zero waste Western in the Earthshake Assistive Technology Center and the interesting work they are doing. We'll open the window on alumnus Hobie Darling, who's the CEO of Skull Candy, and Western's competitive race team. So stay with us as we explore the world through Western Window. Pink snow, or watermelon snow, represents a community of organisms that include microalgae and bacteria. Western Zone Dr. Codner is conducting a first ever large DNA survey with the newest technology in high throughput DNA sequencing. Using these new powerful environmental genomic techniques, they are starting to investigate questions about how these algae communities change with elevation and latitude and how they may be affected by reduction of snowpack in the future. I'm Robin Codner, and I'm an assistant professor in the biology department at Western Washington University. I work on algae, and I've been working on algae for 15 years, and I've done a lot of different kinds of things with um, algae. I currently mostly study um, marine microalgae, but last year I started a new project working on algae that live in snow. Algae is actually a, a grab bag term for a bunch of different things that do photosynthesis that aren't plants. It's interesting how all of these algae are related. Uh, they're actually pretty closely related and not that different. So algae as a group are super, super diverse and you can find them in almost any environment. And so what I'm really interested in is also their evolutionary relationships. So the algae that live in snow and the algae, that, the green algae that you find on the beach, they're actually from the same group. If you ever see pink snow in the late spring or early summer, that is algae that are living in the snow and they actually live in a community with other microbes, fungi, bacteria. I've been observing snow algae for years because I'm a mountaineer and I'm always finding myself up in the snow and have seen these communities and I knew they were algae and I was interested in who they are and what they were doing, sort of a passing interest. In recent years, the methods that I use to study algae communities, which are these uh, really large DNA sequencing projects from the environment where we can identify all of the diversity from a single sample, those methods are really well suited for studying um, the snow algae populations and no one has actually done that before with our new DNA sequencing methods. So it seemed like a really appropriate um, match for my interests. And so even though this algae that are on snow are pink colored, they're green algae as well. And they're just pink colored because they have a bunch of um, molecules in them that act as sunscreen that make them look pink. So I have a laboratory in the biology department and um, we, so I have all the resources that I have in my lab as well as other resources in the biology department. So uh, we have some really nice microscopes that I use as well as um, instruments that help us amplify the DNA. So a lot of the samples are still in the queue for having for sequencing. So uh, last year I was one of the principal investigators who uh, received a grant from the National Science Foundation to build a molecular ecology facility at the Shannon Point Marine Labs and that's down in Anacortes. And I work there and they uh, for doing all of my marine work. Uh, but the part of that um, part of that new facility that we built includes a new high throughput DNA sequencer. And so now we have our own sequencer here at Western. We've been in the process of setting that up this year. So hopefully all of these samples will be sequenced um, down at the Shannon Point campus. So we have all these samples being ready to be sequenced and some of the delays with that have been setting up the new lab. But a lot of the other part of my research is doing the data analysis. So when you do really big DNA sequencing projects for the environment, you get about somewhere between 50 million and 300 million sequences per sample. And that's only become possible in the last couple of years. So it's really aided by 
uh, advances in DNA sequencing technology. And because of that, to analyze our data, we need to use a lot of computers. And so some of the biggest advances that have happened in my lab in the last year have been on the computer side and on the bioinformatics side. So I have a number of undergraduates that work in my lab, and I also have three graduate students. And everyone is really excited about this project, and so we're going to have some group hikes uh, this summer to collect snow algae. I have people aiding me in my research, so I developed a collaboration with the National Park Service this summer, and we uh, integrated this project into their BioBlitz program, and the BioBlitz program is this outreach with visitors to the park so that they can participate in science. And so from there we've developed a citizen science component where I have these sampling kits that people can pick up at the ranger station in Marble Mount and then take them with them on their hiking trip and if they see snow algae they can scoop it into the tube and the tube has a preservative for DNA so that I can pick the samples up later and then um, use them and process them for DNA and use them in my sequencing research. And then of course anybody who's interested can contact me to get sampling kits and it would be great to have lots of folks. So you can find my information on the biology department website which has my email and contact info and also a link to my lab website. The more the merrier, so I hope that we can get them in the hands of a bunch of Western students. Do you know what you can throw away or what you can recycle? We all think we do, but we are a long way off from making Western a zero waste environment. I didn't think it would be so hard to educate college students. Uh, <laughs> I really didn't think that people could be so ignorant about how to sort their trash and not care about where things are going. Zero Waste Western's mission is basically right in its name, uh, just making Western what we hope could be a zero waste university. I don't think that most students are knowledgeable about Western's waste at all. I would say if I had to range from like a zero to a ten on how much they knew about waste, most students I would say were probably at a two. A lot of students don't know that coffee cups are compostable and their lids are recyclable. Um, also paper towels and napkins are also compostable, which we always find in the landfill. Those are definitely the big ones that if those were changed it would make a big difference. This one I know for certain is landfill recycling. <laughs> so is the whole thing recycling or would you do anything Just differently? Just the bottom. Okay. This is not recyclable. What do you think that is? Landfill. Uh, lid is landfill, cup is compost. The lid can't be uh, recycled, but you can recycle the cup. I know I'm supposed to recycle that, or at least this part, I'd guess. <laughs> so this would be trash and this would be recyclable. I'd, um, I think I'd compost this and then uh, I'd recycle this. It's not something that a lot of college students think about. It's not on our everyday minds, but it is really important for the environment and for Western's money. And our tuition could potentially go down if we stopped spending so much money throwing away things that didn't need to be thrown away. Really, really excited today to have this man in our studio on campus, the president and CEO of Skull Candy, which is a leading audio brand that uh, reflects the collision of fashion and music and action sports all kind of into one. Mr. Hobie Darling, who also 
is a representative of the class of 1997. He's a Western alum. Hobie, thank you so very much. For Go Vikings. Good to be here, Chris. I'm Cheers. really excited Woo. to have you on campus. Holy cow. So coming back into town from yeah. Park City, Utah, um, you're a busy man. You're a very, very busy man. There's a lot going on. I mean, I, I have to say, though, it was so much fun. I went for a run down along the bay this morning and ran through campus and all the things that have changed. But it's just beautiful. You know, I think you forget how just special place Bellingham is and what a special place Western is. So it's awesome to be back. Tell us a little bit about your story about how you ended up at Western in the first place as sure. a student. You know, I initially went to, uh, you know, a, a bad school down south called PLU for a year and, <laughs> and played football down there, but quickly figured out there were, uh, you know, better things that I should be doing. Um, but, uh, but left PLU and I, I actually, you know, took about a year and was down in Mexico kind of figuring out, hey, what do I want to do, you know, with sure. my life and, mm -hmm. and took that time and Western had a program in Mexico that, you know, I, I think I was literally out, you know, out on the beach or out one night and I met some kids from Western like, oh, we're doing this program in Morelia, went and enrolled in that program and then came back to Western. Wow. Yeah. For those who don't know what Skull Candy is, sure. Can you let us know a little bit about what Skull Candy is and maybe some of the initiatives that you've got going on there. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think if you think about audio and you think about headphones 10 years ago before Skull Candy, you think black, you think white, it was just a way that you listen to music. And really Skull Candy was founded up on a mountain on a chairlift, up snowboarding by our founder, where he was trying to take a call and you know, before that you couldn't actually click through and take a call from your headphones. Right. So he invented that. And uh, so we were really born out of innovation up on a mountain and some of the best mountains in the world taking that piece, as you said, of music, youth culture, snowboarding, riding, and bringing that together as a lifestyle, not just kind of a commodity item. Right. And, uh, you know, really over the last two years since I've been there, probably the biggest part has been how do we go from that cool headphone company to let's really be an audio science company that's about how do we take the power of music, right. help people perform better, help them have more fun, but really infusing that science piece. So, you know, probably the most exciting thing we have going on right now is we just started our sports and human performance lab, okay. which is run by a three-time Olympian. Um, that right off of Sochi and uh, she essentially is studying with some of the best neuroscientists in the world what is the effect of music on our brain whether that's you know training for the Olympics to whether that's a kid with ADD and maybe trying to get him off of some kind of drug to someone with dementia but all of those are really looking at taking that power of music and you know let's see what we can do around human performance and potential so wow. some really really fun science stuff yeah. coming out of you know I think something that's just so base that you know, seven billion people on the planet. What do we all love? Music. Right. That's about it that we can agree on. And, uh, you know, doing some really cool things out of that right now. A lot of people would say that a liberal arts or humanities degree uh, isn't necessarily the best way to go. What would you say? I mean, obviously, yeah. you've done a pretty good, you're pretty darn successful right now at yeah. this point. And you've done a really good job with your, your career. So what would you say to people who would say that a, a humanities degree or a liberal arts degree isn't the way to go. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Chris. And, you know, and I say this in that I think, you know, so many different degrees that are important. And if I look at, you know, whether it's in engineering or it's different STEM programs, I mean, I think so many of them are so important to what we've done at Skull Candy, what we've done at Nike. I think one of the things that's really special about having a liberal arts degree or having a history degree or an English degree is just number one, so much is around how do you inspire people? You know, and so much of that is around writing and so much of that's around communication. And I think you get a lot of that when you are, you know, you're presenting to people, you're writing papers, you're thinking about how do people behave historically? How does that affect now? But it's really getting in to kind of that inner psyche of people right. um, that I think you miss in a lot of other programs that don't have that liberal arts, at least the prereq part of it, sure. you know, to come from. I think that number one. And then I think the second one, if I think about you know, for us as a company, or I think about the companies that I've been at before, such a big element of it is around creativity. You know, there's a spot of, yeah, can we figure out how to build it? Check. Super important. But yeah, we can figure that out. But there's that spot that goes, okay, how are people interacting with their right. surroundings? How are people, you know, looking at the world differently? And I think that creative piece of, you know, having an education that's been about people and about philosophy and about history. Right. And really gives you that spark on creativity. <clears throat> well, we're running low on time, but before I let you go, um, sure. 
I know you mentioned you're from Kashmir, and yeah. actually, I know you don't know this, but uh, I, I I know that when you oh, um, the old I, apples I, I know. College. So when you head back to uh, <laughs> when you head back to Park City, Utah, I know they probably don't have very good fruit flavored candy, especially coming from Washington. So I did get that for you. Also, I, actually, I love so. it. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had the apples in college. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much Cheers. for coming back to campus. Thank you. Really so good to see you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. Cheers. Hobie Darling, class of '97, yeah. president and CEO of Skull Candy. Go Vikings. Earthshake Assistive Technology Resource Center on Western's campus is a hands-on lending library that houses hundreds of support technology tools. The purpose of the center with these tools is to improve participation in life and increase access to learning for a wide range of individuals with diverse needs. I'm Linda Schlieff and I'm the director of the Urshig Assistive Technology Resource Center. I've been here for, this is my 18th year here. Assistive technology is essentially any item that improves functioning. We, we don't know until we get these tools in general environments how much other people might benefit from them. And it's the same with the tools that we have here. They can definitely benefit people with disabilities, but they benefit others with diverse needs as well. We have tools for people who are unable, for example, to turn a light switch off and on, so um, buttons and switches that they can use to control things in the environment, um, tools that will help them with grooming and daily care kinds of activities, um, tools for people who are blind or have vision impairment, um, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, and then also for really more commonly occurring disabilities. And those would be things like learning disabilities, uh, which occur quite frequently. Uh, every teacher is likely to have two to three students with a learning disability in their classroom every year. Um, things like attention deficits, things like behavior challenges. So. Um, if a student has trouble focusing and attending, there are tools that can help bring their focus and attention to the work that they're doing. We also have a lending library so that not just professionals in training, but families in the community and professionals in the community can come here and borrow tools and try them with uh, individuals that they live and work with. So after we sit down and brainstorm about tools, where um, if the family hears about a tool that they think will benefit their student at home, they can apply for a $200 grant that will support them in purchasing that technology. We really focus here on low to mid-tech tools because that's what most people can afford, both families and individuals, but also um, organizations and schools. That's what professionals in training are most likely to see when they get out in the field because that's what's affordable and available. This is a, a magnifier, a bar magnifier. And our first thought about a magnifier would be for someone with a vision impairment. Um, and certainly this can benefit that person. But it also can benefit uh, someone who has trouble focusing and attending. So I can use this bar magnifier and put it on the page. It also has a, a yellow highlighter line running down the middle of it. And that allows me to um, use it to highlight the place where I am on the page. When we talk about tools that um, benefit more students than they were intended for, we're thinking about a concept called universal design for learning. So when we talk about making environments accessible, we might think first of physical accessibility, and that's really important. Um, but we want to think beyond that uh, into thinking about social accessibility. We want to think about language accessibility. We want to think about cognitive and curriculum access. Instead of waiting until a 
person with a particular challenge shows up and then retrofitting to meet that, that person's needs, we want to have an environment that is ready for anybody who walks through the door. The fact is, if the teacher wears a microphone and we have a speaker that amplifies the teacher's voice, there are many students in the classroom who benefit from, again, having the teacher's voice highlighted as something critical to attend to. For me, working in the center is uh, a, a really a dream come true. I uh, am a special educator, and so I worked with children with complex um, disabilities in the Ferndale School District for uh, about 20 years, and then came to this job um, already fascinated by the technologies and tools that had been able to benefit my students. I also uh, am really really happy when I'm able to sit down with a family and a school team and help brainstorm about tools that will benefit a student and um, we're able to come up with some tools that will allow a student with a physical disability for example to get his really valuable um, and creative ideas out of his head and onto um, paper. Um, I've also had the opportunity to see students who are unable to speak, students with autism for example, um, who are absolutely delighted and amazed to have an iPad in their hands that will speak for them and, and tell their family what they want rather than having to uh, exhibit that desire through behavior um, and that again is uh, indescribable really to have that opportunity um, and those are things we wouldn't be able to do without the support of the Urshik family um, and the support of Woodring College of Education. This is a, definitely a team effort. Uh, we have other donors as well um, and uh, I just think it's an opportunity for people to give to the community and uh, that's what makes my job so enjoyable. Western students have a competitive race team. But it's not on land, it's on water. For over 35 years, sailors at Western have been among the highest performing collegiate racers in the nation. But it is more than a competitive sport. Sailing is a way of life. We are Western's competitive race team. So as a team, we practice and compete in FJs, uh, flying junior sailboats, and we compete against other universities in our district. Sailing's a really fun sport. We're all like really close. We, you make some really good friends out of it. We're a really tight-knit team. We travel a lot. It's a really good sport to get into. The thing is, is that not a lot of people know how to sail, and so it feels very unique to be able to get on a boat and just set up the sails and go. In the fall we start out with a lot of new people and so we kind of work from there teaching them the basics and then building up the bottom to build up the top as well to be a more competitive as a whole. It's something that's very technical and it's something that's very challenging. It's uh, something where if you want to be a professional in it you have to be doing it for at least 10 to 12 years at least. It's quiet, and it's, but when you combine that with racing, it's challenging also. So you can race, you can race cars, or you can you know, run cross country, but when you mix the two, there, it's just a lot more fulfilling. I enjoy the combination of athleticism and strategy. It also gets your mind thinking about a lot of different factors. There's a lot of lines, there's a lot of different situations, and I don't think I've ever had two races that were exactly the same, so it's good if you're really up for challenge. It's like any other sort of racing, except there's no track, there's no set course. One of the biggest problems that people have with sailing is adjusting to changing conditions. So if the wind gets heavier or lighter, you know, some people don't adapt fast enough. Sometimes you'll get wind from, you know, shifting directions and making it a little bit difficult to sail as quickly in, in your ideal direction. There's so many minor things that you kind of pick up here and there, and there's a lot of intricate details that um, 
if you kind of gloss over, you won't be the best sailor that you could be. The um, best sailor can sail in any condition. So if you're able to sail in light wind to really heavy wind to shifty wind, if you can sail in every single different type of condition, then you're a really great sailor. It's like you're playing chess with you know, 10 other boats and none of them are on your team. So it's all a big mental game and a lot of strategy and a lot of dynamics. The interesting thing about it is that you don't have to be extremely good. You don't have to be old. You don't have to be fit. You can be, you know, six years old and sail opties or you can be 80 years old and sail catches. It doesn't matter, but it, anyone and any ability can sail. Just having that uh, drive to learn and drive to explore the sport uh, is what really makes a good team member and a good sailor overall. As of right now, in our district, we are the best. That wraps up this episode of Western Window. Be sure to tune in next time as we explore the world at and around Western Washington University. Western Window is proud to partner with the following student publications. Clipson Magazine is published twice each quarter and includes features, multimedia, and issues that affect lives across the greater Bellingham area. You can find it online at clipsonmagazine.com. The Western Front is the official newspaper of Western Washington University, published by the Student Publications Council and funded by your advertising dollars. The Western Front. Get it first, get it right, at westernfrontonline.net. The Planet is Western Washington University's award-winning quarterly environmental publication and the only undergraduate environmental magazine in the United States. Explore the Planet online at planet.wwu.edu.